Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, if you happen to have come to our interim, um, one that we did a couple of weeks ago, uh, this is the robust version, but I will warn you now, I could not possibly fit everything Thing that we got um, and all the uh, work that everyone's doing on the team to research what's going on. We couldn't fit everything in, um, but we put a lot in. Uh, so let's get started. Um, okay, so the agenda today, we're going to talk about the survey. We're going to talk about those results. Uh, we're going to talk about what that next phase is going to look like. And then we just have some considerations for you. Um, I don't think anybody has a reference point for this that is living right now. Um, so it's about perspectives and considerations and what can we do to make our lives better, our employees' lives better. Um, so let's get on to the survey. Um, first, let's start with some comments. Now, if you were here for the interim presentation, I didn't change these. These are still really valid uh, comments that are coming through. Um, you know, I, I, I keep going back to that one about expenses incurred. Does it mean layoffs? People are asking those questions. Um, if you think your people aren't, you know, impacted by what's happening, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in the economy, in the environment, they're watching it on the news, even if it hasn't happened to your agency, these types of things are in the ether for them and, and it's coming up. You know, this is all scary comment, I think says a lot. Um, and about making rules that relate to the lowest common denominator, then that might not be the way we're used to creating policies and guidelines. Um, we're maybe used to doing them for the majority. And I think what we see a lot of comments um, are about doing it for the minority and keeping that in mind. Um, this idea of mixing things. So I thought that was interesting because we've seen a lot of comments about flexibility, um, but this person thinks it might get really complicated. It might be really hard to, to keep that product productivity up. Um, that the honor system isn't enough. Make sure that you know, people are really on side with it and that they're signing things. I think people want, um, they're, again, people are watching the news, they're seeing what's going on. They know that there are divergent views on things and I think their safety of themselves, their self-safety is, it's, it's number one. Um, you know, maybe, I, I think this is an interesting one. Talk about inclusion um, and diversity and I think agencies are struggling with maintaining that inclusive, in, inclusive environment. Um, and so this, you know, one person's positing, this might just be another um, nail in that coffin that we don't want to see. Um, some really great thoughts throughout. A few comments about this. Let's stop this. We've got a new way of working. Let's not return to where we were, um, but let's move forward into thinking about a new way of doing things. Um, and, and let's be modern. None of this in office and out of office. Um, and, you know, we really, I say this often myself, uh, we have the privilege of working in an industry where remote work is possible. So seeing how that uh, can really be embraced. Um, one thing that we saw coming through in a lot of the comments is that anxiety and stress. Um, and there are a lot of things that are impacting that. That is things that are happening within the agency, within our teams, within our own roles, but also the environment around us does a lot to impact that. And I think we're seeing a lot of that over the last couple of days. Um, uh, Scott, did you have any comments that you wanted to make yeah. on? Yeah. I did. Um, the, the thing that I wanted to share that came through loud and clear for me was going through all of the comments, all of the space where people could free format, put in their thoughts. There was a lot of them and a lot more than perhaps we've seen of any other survey that we've really conducted. And people are really feeling it. And, and the, the one that kept ringing in my mind was somebody who actually made the comment that they were thinking of now is the time to leave the industry. And, and look at the conduct, not only of what's going on in their agency, but also considering what brands are doing, what our clients are doing, how they're responding. Um, and so it was actually quite, uh, I have to say, a bit of a take-aback moment as I was going through some of those comments and reading them. 
uh, they are real and people are feeling it and but people are happily contributing more than we've ever seen before to air those points of view uh, which and i know lee will talk about this which means that we need to think about those one-to-one conversations that real connection we are aren't having with our people around these anxieties because it is impacting and will be impacting how they view our industry our work and, and how we work together and um uh, and connect with our clients Okay, so on to some of the findings. Uh, the way we structured it was um, we asked a little bit about the respondents, so I've got uh, some demographics for you there. Uh, we broke it down into guidelines and into policies, and we asked people about their personal situations, but also their personal feelings. Again, another comment that really resonated with me, um, again, there was a lot of anxiety and stress in here, um, don't put pressure on us to choose. Um, again, a lot of times, you know, I have said uh, in some of these leadership groups that working from home is a little bit of a misnomer, that we're really sheltering in place and we're trying to get some work done. Um, and some people are feeling that more than others. I, I think another really great analogy or illustration is that we're on the ocean, we're in a storm, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. And I think we, we, got, we saw that as well through some of the com comments. And I think we see that in some of the demographics as well. We're gonna try and go through um, as much of that as possible. So uh, onto the respondents, um, this is what it looked like. So a little bit more heavily weighted towards um, client leadership, media, uh, and creative uh, with a smattering of corporate management in there um, and, uh, and new business. Um, so that was how that kind of panned out. Um, and then uh, we asked respondents kind of right off the bat, I hit them with a question about confidence in leadership. Um, and what's interesting here is that there was a very too extremely confidence in leadership um, uh, but, uh, but there's a little bit of an interesting breakdown, um, when we get into the tenure and that's going to be on the next slide. Um, the tenure that we had participating in the survey was executive 17%, um, a little bit more heavily weighted to the, um, senior and intermediate folks. So again, just going back to this confidence and leadership, just to break it down, I thought it was an interesting one. I thought it was, um, I, 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 and I don't know why. I don't have an answer for for why this would be. I can, you know, I have some conjecture as to why executives might um, have a little bit more confidence uh, in 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 their leadership through this phase and in the guidance that they're providing through this phase. It might be um, because there's more communication with the executive level. Uh, and if that's the case, I think there needs to be even more. So we see that those junior levels, especially intermediate for whatever reason, is not feeling that confidence. So we have to figure out what is it about that mid-level that's causing that problem? Why is there that gap of um, understanding and, and confidence in, in what's happening? Um, so on to the guidelines and the policies. Uh, so this was something that we shared in the interim results. This has not really changed that much. I think it's pretty uh, similar. I think uh, one stat that may have changed a little bit is the WARN is preferred. We're seeing more agree to strongly agree um, consensus on I want to wear it when I prefer to wear it. Um, don't tell me when to wear it. Uh, there were some comments about um, that's going to be pretty annoying <laughs> wearing a mask all day and expecting you to go to work. Um, and again, those comments were kind of made within that realm of be flexible um, and, uh, and, and, and let me feel my way through for a way that I can be the most productive and feel the most comfortable. Uh, and one thing to remember that I just want to say about masks, I think I say it again um, somewhere else, but they are about containment. They're not necessarily about protection, um, but providing those guidelines. We'll, we'll talk th about that again um, later on. Um, and so face coverings, this is an interesting one. Um, I, you know, in hindsight, whenever I'm doing a survey and once I get the results, I'm like, oh, maybe I should have asked that a different way. I didn't ask about payment. I asked about providing. Um, so the provision. And so overwhelmingly, people think that the agency needs to provide those masks, 
but I didn't ask about whether that was a uh, permanent mask or whether that was a disposable mask. Um, but I think the overwhelming consensus is that the agency has felt that they need to provide that mask. Um, taking temperature. I think this is an interesting one. Um, there's definitely uh, some people are fine with taking that responsibility, but also think in this exact same way and to an equal measure that the agency has to take that responsibility as well. So something that we've said early on is that you might want to invest in your own temperature taking um, equipment. Uh, and yes, you can still have a policy that suggests that employees should be taking their temperature routinely pre-work before they come to work, um, but that uh, I, I, I think a lot of employees are also expecting that the agency will um, take part of that responsibility as well. Um, and and we'll, we'll see how that kind of comes through from a sickness perspective later on in the survey. So we asked about people's safety and how they felt about workplace, um, whether they felt that the workplace should be restricted to employees only, um, and so that would include vendors and clients being restricted, um, as well as, uh, you know, other, you know, family members, um, pets, uh, things like that, that there should be restrictive policies in place. Um, they felt that it should be disinfected nightly. Um, and I think, you know, I didn't, I only asked about disinfecting nightly. I think if I had to put in all kinds of other um, available answers, we probably would have seen a really interesting mix because in the comments, uh, there was a lot of concern about disinfection, um, how often it was going to be done, uh, whether it was going to be done routinely throughout the day. So I think if I had to ask three hours and six hours, we probably would have gotten a lot of response for that as well, but definitely very overwhelming. What's interesting on this slide, I think, is the restricting common areas. Um, and what I felt that the data was telling us was a little bit of a story about how each person is thinking about their own common areas and their own agency um, and really responding not in a bra I have my idea of what a common area is based on my workspace and how small that is. Um, you put one person into our kitchen at the ICA and that is a different kind of feeling than maybe another agency with a more open environment. Um, and so I think what you're seeing there is that there are some people who are comfortable with their environments and some people who aren't. So the physical distancing, um, we asked about staggering re reintroduction. Obviously, that's definitely something that overwhelmingly people see that that is being a positive thing. Um, they are expecting, and this came through in the comments as well, they know that they're expected to physical distance. But again, there's an annoyance there um, that why do I have to do that? Is that really an environment that I want to be in? Um, some comments as well about the inclusion aspect. Um, and, and, and of course, workstations two meters apart, there's an expectation that that's going to happen uh, and that that's going to be managed and communicated by the agency. Uh, we asked about implementing policies. Um, and, uh, you know, not a lot of policies have work from home options. I think it's something that the industry has always been able to do. Um, and I know for myself as a, a COO of an agency, I purposely did not put work from home options. And I don't think that I was alone, but I think a lot of the reason why I asked this question, I think a lot of the comments that came through is they want a policy, they want options, they want those to be stated, and I don't think that they want those to go away. There were a lot of comments about permanency. Um, as well, childcare obligations. I think we're seeing some neutral comments here in the red, um, and that can mean sometimes some people commented that, well, I put neutral because it doesn't relate to me. I, I hope that we can get to that place where childcare obligations, um, there should be an overriding understanding for, and not just childcare obligations, but care obligations, whether that is someone who's, um, whether you're a parent, whether you're, care you're caring for any type of dependent, um, but really having an understanding throughout the agency. This is where the diversity and the inclusion comes in um, to make sure that your policies are speaking to all of those things. So people don't have to ask for um, uh, uh, these types of considerations to be made ongoing, but there's really an inclusion into the policy. So definitely overwhelming. Um, they agree to strongly agree that these should be part of the policy. 
Again, in-person meetings, um, they want a policy. Uh, again, strong 74%. They think that that's important. It should be regimented. Uh, you should have uh, control of that. Limiting travel, I, I, I don't think you'll get a lot of pushback about that now moving forward. Um, and I think that Zoom is such a great thing and all, you know, us using our teams um, and, and different uh, avenues like that. When we had Rory Sutherland come speak to us last fall, he couldn't understand why we weren't using it already and had actually mentioned from a behavioral science perspective, why do board members travel all over the world when they could do their board meeting just quite fine from behind their computer. Um, and he realized this when he had to stay at home for three months um, and wasn't able to go into the office and thought this is fabulous. So I think um, people are now understanding how they can work within a different type of travel policy. They're expecting it for COVID. But I think you might wanna think about what that looks like post COVID as well. Obviously sick days are a really important thing to people, uh, getting sick, how am I going to be treated at the office when I am sick? Um, and how many sick days am I going to get? And what kind of policy is there going to be for that? And I think um, we need to be as specific as possible about our about sickness, how sickness is treated, um, and how sick day pol and how sick days are treated. So um, one of the suggestions that I found that was really interesting in my research was even think of doing a flowchart so that employees have a yes no visual path for how they're going to deal with certain things. Uh, whether that's a temperature reading, a cough, a sneeze, an ache. Um, if I live with someone or have interacted with someone who's positive, what do I do in all those situations? And sometimes having a visual flow chart can be really, really helpful for employees. Um, and who do I talk to? Who's my first phone call when that happens? Um, and how do I move through uh, that uh, so that I'm not thinking about that every time I know exactly what I'm supposed to do? And then, of course, getting uh, acknowledgement for all of these policies. When we're talking about implementing policies, it's a new thing. We know we need to get buy-in on that and so making sure that they're well documented and that we're uh, communicating them and getting sign up. So moving into some of the personal situation and feelings questions. Um, we asked about whether people wanted to work from home or return to work. Uh, and I think that this is interesting because we have a huge percentage that want to continue working from home. Um, that's consistent with some other data that we have later on in the presentation. But there's also some of those people, obviously, if we look at the numbers, that do want to return to the workplace. Um, so you're going to have those folks that want both. Um, they do see an advantage to continue working from home. They might have some personal reasons for why they want to do that, but there's also a desire to return to the workplace. Um, and I know in speaking to, to many of you, you're looking at having flexible um, arrangements, whether that's hoteling, you want to have some place for people to go to, you know that they're going to have those, those times where they want to have that break. So we asked what were some of the reasons why you might want to work from home and again as I said this is there are different things that are going to be impacting why someone wants to stay working from home. One of the most obvious ones is childcare obligations. Until school goes back to a regular schedule that is back inside the school, um, then parents are going to be struggling with how am I gonna keep my child educated and looked after um, and go to the office. So that's obviously the number one uh, reason there. Um, but we can see, and I don't think that this is a huge surprise, but there is, uh, a, you know, the way the tenure pans out for who chose this. So this is looking at, and the way you need to read this slide is this is just the agree to strongly agree. And how did that pan out by each of the cohorts? So when you're looking at the executives, those of the executive that chose agree to, and strongly agree, that was 36% of that cohort. 39% um, of senior, that makes sense. Um, we're gonna have some in the executive level that might be empty nesters, um, and you might see more of that senior level having children at home along with the intermediate, and of course the juniors, it's not as large of, um, uh, uh, of an issue or a challenge for them. Um, working from home due to an interaction 
with someone who is either a frontline worker or high risk. Um, and, and we thought, as Scott and I were talking these through, that they were a little bit higher than what we had um, thought that they might be. So definitely, we're seeing that there are a lot of high-risk people in, in, in people's lives. And so we need to understand what those are. You're not always going to know that. That's not necessarily something that someone provides to you in the onboarding and lets you know. And maybe sometimes they may not even let you know in general conversation. So that might have to be a specific conversation with someone to find out why do you want to work from home and and have those probing one-on-one -on -one conversations to make sure that you can make them feel as comfortable as possible uh, in your new situations and as the phases uh, go through um, and of course interacting with frontline worker again 21 percent um, so commuting we i asked a few questions about that uh, and public transit was one reason why some folks wanted to work from home. They found that overwhelming. I would say that the comments really spoke to that as well. Commuting, uh, being on the GO train um, uh, were all things that people said, you know, I have multiple trains to go on. I have multiple uh, different types of public transit that I have to hit. And they saw that as every time they had to go to something different, that increased their risk exponentially in their mind. And I think that that's a really interesting perspective. It's very valid. Um, one thing that we're seeing that's really interesting, um, anecdotally, I've, I've seen some articles written about bike sale surges in the States. I haven't read anything that's Canadian specific, but I do know from myself anecdotally, there wasn't a time that I haven't been in the in the, my, my bike shop that I go to regularly where someone hasn't been buying a bike. So that's interesting. Um, I think people are looking for alternate modes of transportation and things that they see as, uh, as safer for them, especially during the warmer weather. Uh, again, commuting, they are concerned about their safety during the commute. Again, that's a pretty high number and uh, I don't think it's surprising. We broke that down by the agree plus, uh, so agree to strongly agree. And we broke that down by tenure. And again, you're seeing the bulk of those folks, those cohorts um, in the entry and junior and those intermediate. So I think it's important for the executive to understand not everybody is driving a car that they're singularly in, um, or maybe even walking to work. Um, maybe some of our executives live closer to the office or have greater accessibility and are in safer conditions. So making sure that those perspectives of our younger folks are really understood by the more senior folks. So concerns about the virus. Uh, we asked a few questions about this. Uh, people are, of course, worried about uh, colleagues coming to work and being sick and passing that on. They're also very concerned about themselves. And I, I think, again, this links in with the commuting, um, with their high risk um, uh, you know, interactions that they may have. Uh, and so we're seeing a high, uh, very to extremely concern uh, about the virus. They're concerned about catching it on the commute. They're also concerned about catching it on the, uh, at the office, although not as much, um, which I, I think is interesting, although the somewhat to slightly is then larger. So there are, they're concerned. They're not overwhelmed by catching it at the office. I think there is trust there that you are going to present a, a, a clean office. There were lots of comments about um, uh, that that they had that ability to connect in uh, with leadership and they understood that there was going to be uh, ways that you were going to be making the office clean but it is definitely um, back in, the, in, in the back of everybody's head and I think this data supports that. Uh, again catching it at the office by tenure you've got juniors uh, and intermediate that are really skewing that so they're a little bit more concerned uh, and about me bringing it to the office, again, you've got those executives not so concerned about that. Um, and maybe it's because uh, they've, they've been around a little bit longer. They've seen a few things. Um, maybe we're a little bit more relaxed at that stage. But to remember that uh, our junior folks and our intermediate folks don't have those points of reference um, and to just be sensitive and empath empathetic to that. 
So concerns about the office, we asked them whether they were concerned about being in an open environment. We know that agencies are ones to have open uh, seating and open environments. And so we asked them if there was concerns there, and there are. Um, and there are concerns about cleanliness. Uh, and, and so some of the things that kind of came back to us was um, that they were concerned that it was going to be cleaned in a routine manner, that it was going to be clean enough. Um, again, as I preface everything at the beginning, these folks are reading things, they're seeing things on the news. They know how long the virus lasts. They know that ventilation is important. Um, so making sure that uh, you or your landlord has put HEPA filters in, doing the extra cleaning. Um, but I would also say, from my part, determine what the landlord is gonna be paying for. Um, personally, what I am seeing and what I'm hearing is that landlords are, are not being affected as much as everybody else. Um, I think it's important to let the ICA know if there's something that we can do with your landlord from that respect, um, and to just make sure that, uh, that you're being, um, uh, cared for properly within your building uh, and that they are looking after the cleanliness uh, of, of different spaces, especially the bathroom. Um, to keep in mind that sneezes and coughs can amplify beyond the six feet. Um, so we know that. And so, you know, making sure that there are those guidelines to sneeze into your sleeve um, and to make sure that we're communicating this. And for some of us, it might be you know, how does someone not know that, but to make sure that you're communicating it and doing it in a really simple uh, and very visual way. Um, uh, and uh, thinking about the cleanliness in the office, it really is about touching the same object. It's a very important part of it. And it's about distance, it's about density, and then the time exposure. So we know that on metals and plastic, it lasts for three hours. So um, you know, I have heard of some people hiring someone just for that, whether the landlord does that or whether that's um, someone that, uh, if you have a large enough agency with enough of those things that get touched often, um, at least having regimented guidelines for how those things are going to be uh, cleaned and how that's done, um, where you're using gloves, where you're not using gloves and things like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, even for my part, I've kind of did a mental walk around my office and the things that I use and, and think about um, the water cooler and the printer and, and things that when you think about that, those are things that are often touched. And so how are you going to deal with that? Uh, vacation time concerns. I had brought this up in the interim presentation, still a concern. Uh, and 38% um, are very too extremely. So I didn't have them elaborate on what that concern was. Um, it wasn't an open-ended question, but we'll be talking about vacation a little bit more. It is a question that comes up all the time, um, and I still get it, uh, both from employees and from managers, concerned about how do I address this. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, make a plan to get a plan. Uh, we asked about plans. Um, pretty much off the top of the survey, we asked about that. Um, and so some people had given their thoughts to what, uh, what they thought a plan should look like. Um, be transparent, of course, came up a ton. There wasn't just one comment for be transparent. It was probably be transparent was almost in every single one of them. Uh, and um, have discussion forums was another really great comment. And, and allowing anonymous feedback. So we asked people if they had a return to work plan and if you had joined us for the interim presentation, it was very, very high at 84% that said they had not been provided with any plan, even a preliminary plan. That's come down a little bit. Um, we have, we added another 200 uh, respondents since the interim presentation. Um, it's still not as low as what we'd like it to be, but it's at least getting there. So on that planned communication, those that responded yes, we asked them a couple of questions about the plan. Uh, was there an anonymous outlet for feedback? And many said yes. Was the plan well communicated? Uh, that was overwhelmingly positive. Um, but were all questions answered? There is still some issue there. So while people were still responding, yes, it was well communicated, 
but there were a lot of holes still. And I, and I, and I get that um, because I think that's, you're closing the holes every week as every week goes by, you're learning a little bit more, understanding a little bit more about what you're dealing with and as things phase through. But I think that's an important one to just keep in mind, how am I responding to questions? How are managers responding to questions? How are those questions that are being posed to managers making their way up the chain to the executive um, so that things can actually be dealt with? Just making sure that you have a process in place. Uh, so let's talk about the next phase. Um, um, return to work. I am preferring to call it forward to work. Um, we had a wonderful session the other day with Harja, and I think he just managed to articulate in such a positive and optimistic way about we don't necessarily want to go back to the way it was, nor can we go back to the way it was. Uh, so really kind of changing your perspective on things and thinking, oh, we're, we're not really returning. We're actually going forward. We're moving forward into something else. And to remember, it has been a sprint that our folks have gone through over the last, I don't know what week we're in. I don't keep track, 10, 11. Um, and it has been a sprint. And our people have done some amazing things. People have pulled it out of places they did not know it existed. They have pulled all-nighters. They have worked on the weekend. They have turned around and gotten executions produced and in market in record time. That's a sprint. And you do not sprint 26 miles. You run 26 miles. Um, and that's a marathon. And you take your time with doing that. And the pace is less because you want to make it to the end. Um, and so what people are able to do for a short term is not what they're able to do for a long term. So if we don't make sure that that starts feeding its way down into our ranks, we're going to start seeing some problems and we'll start seeing some cracks. And we're already seeing some of those cracks now. And so one thing that we're going to be seeing is mental health issues. And these are pre-COVID stats, um, so I can only assume that they're probably a little bit higher. Um, but people are uncomfortable sharing a psychological health issue, but we need to make it comfortable for them. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about how we communicate as managers. Um, but that's, that's a, still in, in this day and age, it's a, it's a staggering number. We have 47% that consider their work to be the most stressful part of their day. And again, that's pre-COVID. I can only imagine what that is post-COVID. Um, and 25% have left a job citing uh, workplace stress and that toll. So I think it's important for us to understand good stress and bad stress as managers. Um, to, you know, good stress, we all have good stress in our life. It's very motivating. When we hit into that bad stress, it's fatiguing, it's exhausting, it's demotivating, it's debilitating. So making sure that managers know how to spot that, um, what that difference is between good stress and bad stress. And then making sure that we're communicating our EAP support systems. Um, most of us have them included with our benefits. Uh, and so to make sure uh, that those are being uh, communicated. And if you don't have one, then connect with us because we have some really great ICA member recommendations for some fabulous ones that they've implemented over the last little while. Um, and of course, removing the stigma. And this is all about executives, I think, making sure that they're empathetic with people understand their different realities and start to remove those stigmas um, and to build confidence in the workplace. Of course, uh, disconnecting, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit when we talk about PTO, um, and also making sure that our physical health and our sleep um, is being looked after. So how we deal with PTO. Um, so this is just some of my thoughts, things that have worked for me in the past. Um, when I've had issues with people taking vacation. Um, and this has obviously ramped it up. Uh, it's always uh, been in my experience, I've always had issues with people all wanting to take their vacation in November. And what do you do about that? It's that same type of, of, of issue. Um, so make sure that you are first and foremost transparent about the vacation schedule. 
Um, it is a really great jumping off point for managers to have that discussion. And it is really all about that discussion. And you may want to even line it up with projected client deliverables. It will then highlight why certain weeks need all hands on deck and it makes it just a much easier conversation to have. Um, communicating your vacation policy and all the ins and outs of what that is. It again, it provides for that foundation and that, and that, uh, that baseline, and then you can start having conversations about why someone doesn't maybe want to take their vacation. Um, and that's when you need to be flexible and you need to be creative. And um, we are creative people, and we can come up with different ways of helping our folks do what they need to do in order to disconnect um, and uh, discuss the realities of your business. I think um, there has been some conversation about, you know, what do I say and what do I not say about my business? I will say, um, I'll use the word unprecedented. I can't believe I'm saying that, but um, it is unprecedented in a way because of what they're hearing on the news. They understand cash flow issues. They understand what clients are doing. They're hearing about all of these things on the news all the time because it's affecting businesses and that's coming through. So to not talk about those same things that are affecting your business, um, maybe you're trying to protect them from it. Maybe it's not, it's something that you're like, well, I would have never shared those things with them before. But being transparent about the situation that you're in uh, can bring you all together from a cultural perspective and make them, you know, just understand what you're dealing with and, and how they can help that. Um, and of course, as I've said a couple of times, it really is just about disconnecting. And sometimes we, you know, it's almost, I, and that's why I like using the word PTO, sometimes more than using the word vacation. And that can be, you know, I'm, if you heard any of my presentations, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of language. Language drives how we frame things. And if we talk about it in disconnecting terms rather than vacation, Vacation can mean sitting on a beach um, or taking a cruise, and that's not possible right now. But we do need them from a mental health perspective to disconnect. Um, just a quick thing about personal face masks, um, because people will be using personal face masks regardless of whether you are providing them with disposable face masks. Um, I know I have my personal ones, and so to just make sure that you've communicated how someone is supposed to care for those. Um, we've seen issues in other regions where people have not been doing that very well. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're protecting our employees and giving them the information that they need uh, with the step-by-step -step instructions, not only on how to wear them, but how to clean them. And then if you're using other disposable things, how to dispose them. So again, those one-on-one -on -one conversations, I. Um, this is a recurring theme, uh, something that we've heard come up pretty much on every leadership open discussion that we've had, um, that those one-on-one -on -one conversations are really where the magic happens, essentially. And so we're encouraging people to communicate, 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 and then communicate some more. And again, um, referencing back to the session that we just had with Harjat Singh on Wednesday, who echoed this very same sentiment. Um, you know, group mails, uh, the anonymous check-ins, the, the town halls, those are all really important. And I am not saying that they're not, but they have limitations. And in this time, we really need to be encouraging managers to master that one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's important now more than ever. Um, so we need to train them. And we need to make sure that they're having effective one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, and so how do they do that? That might be a different way than they've managed ever before. When we think about if we are on site with people that we're leading, we see a lot. Uh, a lot of it is by osmosis. Um, we're just in the same vicinity and those things come through for visual cues and physical cues, um, but we have lost that connection. So we now have to uh, be a little bit more targeted in how we're having these conversations. If your managers are struggling with how to do that, um, maybe providing them with some leadership materials, um, some blogs, I can definitely help with that. Um, if anybody is looking for any of those things, I have some great ones. Um, but I think as well, being prescriptive 
and providing managers with a checklist. You cannot ask your direct report, how are you? Because the answer to that is fine. And that will be of no value. And so if that's how things are starting, um, it, it, you won't get anywhere. Um, so it really has to be a targeted uh, way that you're you know, starting those conversations and kind of digging deep into that. Um, I think you can start with 15 minutes. I know I do get eye roll sometimes when I remind managers about have you had those personal conversations. It's time consuming. Some people can have a lot of people that report to them. Um, but start with 15 minutes. Ask those targeted questions. Use a, checkli a checklist approach and then schedule time later for a more in-depth conversation if something comes up. Um, just some thoughts about food. And again, these are things that have come from not only our discussions with people, but also from our research. Um, we eat a lot at the agency. Food is a huge part of our culture. Um, so thinking about how we're going to interact with food when we do start going back into a physical office. Um, how are we supporting our neighborhood restaurants and coffee shops? How does that work? Um, we don't want people leaving if we're in a big office building. Uh, you know, we work in a, 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 on the 30th floor of an office building. If I had to go down every time I wanted a coffee, um, it would take me forever to get back up. I'm going to be in a line. So thinking your way through those things, but knowing that you still want to support those neighborhood restaurants and coffee shops coming up with some type of process some guidelines, uh, guidance for your office uh, and guidance for each individual person. Um, and then, of course, food brought from home. Um, obviously, issues. Uh, there's been a lot of... Uh, um, uh, articles written about food brought from home and what kind of container and how do you do it uh, and so I'm happy to share some of those guidelines with you. Just a little bit about what networks are doing. Everybody always wants to know what the networks are doing so I looked at a few of them and kind of just broad strokes. Um, most are doing a phased approach with their employees um, and of course they are, uh, these are global guidelines and they know they realize in those guidelines that they have offices in different regions and, and they are of course um, going to be adhering to federal and provincial uh, and municipal guidelines uh, that their office is in. Um, they are encouraging, as I said, mentioned before with the temperature checks, those before work personal temp temperature checks. I think that's interesting, that might be a risk mitigation, I don't know. Um, Erica can speak to that. Uh, one thing that I am seeing that they're doing is having well communicated office etiquette. Uh, and again, I think these are very broad office etiquettes. You might want to go deeper for a specific office. You've got you know, your office is unique to you and the people within your office are unique. But one thing that I liked about some of the ones I looked at, they were very easy to read. They were very visual. They used a lot of icons. Um, uh, people are pretty knowledgeable about why you're doing this and what you're doing, um, but to have it all in one place and easily accessible and easily understandable. Um, of course, encouraging alternate commute methods. Uh, the data we got back and the response we got back on commuting, I don't think is a surprise. Um, and clearly that is where some um, reticence is, is coming from. Most are providing and encouraging mask use in the office. Again, a lot of comments about how annoying that would be, um, but yet, uh, you know, no one was really like, I'm not going to do that. Uh, just, a, just an overall, you know, wearing a mask is annoying. Uh, and again, establishing cleaning food and visitor protocols. So again, those were all parts and, and uh, it, does, it goes without saying that shaking hands is now uh, strictly pr prohibited. <laughs> Um, one thing I did want to mention in, in this um, is from a CSR perspective. Um, many of these companies have CSR approaches. They document them very well in their annual reports. Um, for me personally, and, and a lot of what we're hearing on the news about plastics and things like that, do whatever you can from a CSR perspective to try and limit those things. Um, bathrooms, again, the comments came through, a lot of bathroom comments. Um, 
you know, people are going to have to go to the bathroom a lot during the day. And so as soon as they start thinking through their day and thinking about being on site, they consider the cleanliness and physical distancing protocols that have to be in bathrooms and wonder how those are going to happen. So making sure that you've got those figured out for your people. Um, urinals are really close together. Um, and so that is going to be an issue, thinking through that and what that looks like to make sure that there's physical distancing. The sink proximity. Hand dryers. Um, uh, and so there are, is some guidance on how to use a hand dryer, but from the thought leaders that I have read, uh, just try and implement paper towels for now if you can. Um, it's a heck of a lot easier for you to do. Um, and when you use bathroom monitors and regular cleaning, and again, who's paying for that and who's providing that from the landlord perspective. So the provincial guidance, there is a lot of it. Check out the COVID hub on ICA. We've put it all there. Way too much for me to go through here. Um, but lots of talk in all of that guidance about PPE usage. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one when you go out into the public and you see people not using their PPE correctly. So again, making sure that you have those signs up um, in your space and communicating it within your office etiquette, your own office etiquette guides on how you use PPE usage. Um, there's nothing more annoying than seeing it um, below someone's nose. Um, and again, it's a, a lot of guidance that comes through just as an overarching um, thing is it's not set and never check. It is, there is a lot of check, recheck, review, check in with people, um, see how things are doing, uh, just like you would with any workplace safety. So a lot of that same guidance that we use for basic workplace safety uh, measures that we have to have with those folks documenting, reviewing, checking, redocumenting. It's that same process. Um, thinking about inclusion, again, we've talked a lot about inclusion. Um, consider meeting inclusion when staggering uh, uh, return to work. And so, you know, I'm thinking of things where if there are two people out of a three person meeting that are on site, maybe not having the meeting um, in a boardroom, even if you can physical distance, but thinking about that third person, again, going back to that original comment about thinking about the lowest common denominator, thinking about that minority, thinking about the occlusion from that perspective. Another really great tip that I got from a member, consider 25 or 50 minute meetings um, and consider implementing that protocol. People have been just going through Zoom after Zoom after Zoom. It's taxing, it's exhausting, uh, it's debilitating. So uh, can you make some type of protocol within your agency to reduce that so that people have some breathing room um, to get through and, and just help that inclusion aspect? Uh, again, moving forward to work, some minimum requirements. Uh, there is guidance that the, each agency, each business needs to have those minimum requirements set down. We do have a template. I'm happy to send it over to you. And there is guidance on our site that tell you exactly what those minimum requirements are, how you need to kind of tick that box. Thinking about future lockdowns, um, we know this is going to be a dance. We saw that with Sean Donovan when he was here. Uh, one minute, uh, the Singapore office was open, and just before he spoke to us, it had closed down again, and they were back down in lockdown. So um, you have to be ready for that. So scenario plan, hopefully you've been scenario planning through this whole thing. What if kids don't go back to school at a certain time? What if, uh, and what if, and what if? Uh, and then do the checklists now so that you can refer back when it's locked down. And let's talk about some of those checklists. Again, I've got some uh, templates uh, for those checklists, but some really great ones where it's all about really documenting what's happening with your folks um, and, and how you've regimented and gone through that uh, communication with them. You're keeping track of it. Um, whether you need anything that's like a continuity calendar, a risk assessment checklist, even conversation checklists, checklists as I've mentioned, um, pulse surveys, uh, there's lots of uh, articles talking about keeping up with those, making sure that you're doing those pulse surveys, um, 
uh, mid-month, every month. Uh, and people, I know sometimes as leaders, we think about survey fatigue, but boy, did people say that they wanted those anonymous check-ins and they wanted them often. So I would say worry less about survey fatigue and worry more about it being part of your communication schedule back to your employees. Um, policies, hand washing, prevention, response, um, policies, uh, I have all of those. Uh, and as well as forward to work letter templates um, and even an on-site skills needed assessment checklist. Again, lots of comments on, you know, the agency, we don't need everybody. Some people we do need on-site. And so knowing who those are and being able to communicate that effectively. Just a little bit about right to refuse. And again, Erica, can, I'm sure talk to this a lot better than I can, um, but employees can refuse to return to work but you need to understand what their why is. So again, this is about one-on-one -on -one uh, conversations. You're not going to get this in a group email, but to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with someone why they wouldn't want to return to work, make sure that you understand that, what their personal commitments are, uh, whether they feel there's something unsafe about the environment. Um, and as well, if furloughed employees are not returning, making sure that you're getting that in writing um, back from them. Uh, and at the end of the day, employers do set the terms for employment. Um, but again, uh, you know, I've said this a couple of times, even as well as with vacation, um, because you, you do have the ability to set vacation as well. But be careful when using those types of tactics. It does affect your employer relationship. It can affect the culture as well. Um, doing a risk assessment is really important. Again, I have a really great template for this if it's something that you need. But looking at the exposure to others, um, and having a really great uh, checklist that you go through just helps you kind of solidify in your mind all these things that people are doing in their regular day that maybe you're not really aware of and you need to have those conversations about it. Do they work or volunteer somewhere else that could put them in a high risk category? Are they interacting? We saw in the survey that lots of people were interacting with frontline workers and were interacting with high risk individuals and that was of concern for them. Um, looking at their interaction uh, with others and what they have to do as part of their job, uh, whether it's clients, whether it's vendors. Um, and then looking at the physical environment and literally going down and doing a check of what's the workspace uh, uh, you know, risks that are there. What are the sanitation risks and of course the PPE risks. And then crafting those policies and procedures. And most importantly, and this is where the communication comes in, is making sure that people are trained, making sure that they're buying into these policies, they understand them, um, and it is not a one-time thing. You've got to review it, discuss it, communicate it, implement it, and then you need to repeat that. Um, just a little bit about our workspaces, because a lot has been coming up about this. I cannot tell you how many one-on-one -on -one conversations I've had with um, office leads about what's the ideal workspace, and now they're starting to think about that. When we first went into work um, from home, it was seen as very much a short term, and I can get through this and it's no problem. And this is a fabulous workspace. This gentleman has a desk that looks like it's the right height, has a fabulous office chair, a really great light, he's got all of his books and everything he needs right there, but a lot of us don't have a setup like that. And if we don't have a setup like that, we're in line to get all kinds of issues, sore back, carpal tunnel, aching joints, fatigue, headaches, irritability. We know what happens because we've all done it ourselves. Where we've sat in a place that was not perfect for us and tried to stand up eight hours later and realize we've got a problem. Again, we can take things for the short term, but once we start thinking about it in a long-term perspective, uh, our ability to, to go through that is much different. Um, and also considering that we've just gone through a 2030 digital transformation, but we're dealing with 2020 or earlier equipment and processes. And so that's definitely something that we need to think about. I know that there's dollars attached to that, um, but that is something that we need to maybe put our minds to and think about people's reality as well. Understanding what people have. They're sharing a workspace with a partner, a parent, a roommate. Um, of course, they've got pets. Mine, I love mine. They drive me nuts. Um, and of course, children. Um, and, and not to say, you know, of course, most kids are like this, but that's still uh, an issue. You're trying to get work done um, and you're, you know, I'm sure your kids are, are, are well behaved, but it's still not an environment that is totally conducive to getting something um, done by a deadline. 
Um, and sometimes this is what we're dealing with. So not always ideal work situations and trying to keep those top of mind. As I mentioned, we checked in with Fishbowl. Fishbowl had done a survey as well on people who wanted to continue working from home. Um, they did the survey across all of their bowls and um, we found that the advertising and marketing came in second at 62%. I think what's interesting is the chats that, uh, and this is just a couple of them, we didn't go through all 92 comments, and put them here, but obviously a lot of people were interested in what this gentleman was, uh, was talking about, wanting to move out of um, the city of, I think it was Chicago, I can't remember, um, <clears throat> or New York, uh, and wanted to move back into uh, um, the suburbs and then work from home permanently. Um, so just as a reminder about the task force that we want to keep on top of the research, uh, so that's what we've delivered to you today. There is a ton more, um, and I'm happy to provide that um, to anybody that wants that, uh, so link in with me. Um, that guidance, uh, you will find that on the hub. Uh, and of course, we're here for support. So if there's something that you're struggling with or you see as a challenge uh, for the next phase or, or multiple phases that we're going to be going through over the next little while, please let us know because either it's support or it's representation and uh, we can definitely step in there. So some of the next steps, request a copy of the survey. Um, you'll find guidance on the hub. Um, and again, there was tons of stuff that we couldn't fit in the deck, so just connect. Um, and we are looking at uh, a hotline guidance, uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, and I think Scott, at that point, can talk a little bit more about that and, uh, and Erica. Yes, indeed.